graduate from college, we go 20, 30, 40. <laughs> How y'all doing tonight? Uh, <coughs> I'm going to be coughing and sniffing and things like that. I'm about over what I had. I have pharyngitis. Nothing fun. They give you a pill about the big enough to kill a horse. <laughs> you take them twice a day. All kinds of rules. You ever had a pill where you couldn't lay down after you took one? I thought, whoa, what is that all about? Look in chapter 2, verse 12, and following, maybe. I was, I was studying a little more this, this afternoon, and I, I find that, uh, you need a book? Sure. Anybody else need a book? Got one left. problem with my digging is I keep finding stuff. You know what that means? It means we'll never get to chapter 4. We're looking at uh, continuing to work. We're still doing Fulfill My Joy. We're in chapter 2, session 3. And the focus is that we might become children of God. And uh, my partner up there is going to put Verse 12 on the board. He needs Pam to show him how to do it. There we all were looking at it anyway. Therefore, my dear friends, now remember I've got this in the New International Version, so I'll have to share with you some of it that it changes when it goes to King James. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And what he basically is writing here to the church at Philippi is this that they are one of the few churches that followed his instruction in spite of what they were experiencing in spite of what he was going through they uh, they basically did what he told them to do as Christians was appropriate uh, that's pretty cool since when the Lord tells you and me what to do some of us don't pay attention but according to Paul, when he wrote to these folks, they uh, apparently they they were listening, and he puts it very clearly: "You have always obeyed." I guess when Paul gave them doctrine and and the other things that they was being shared, he shared with them that uh, they took it to heart, they studied, they did what they were supposed to do. If you remember now, Philippi is a Roman colony. They're smack in the middle of all kinds of debauchery and any other words you want to use. Uh, the sin was rampant. Uh, heathenism was the worship of the day. and um, In the midst of all that, they were facing some persecution inwardly and outwardly in every way and what have you. And and basically, he's telling them in this verse here that uh, just because I'm not there, it would be suspected that you might flop off a little bit. You might not be the Christians you are meant to be. But he's saying, even when I'm not there, you are still doing whatever you need to do.
Rejoicing together. What I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverence, and sensitivity before God. That energy is God's energy and energy deep within you. God himself willingly in work and working at what will give him the most pleasure. Do everything readily and cheerfully, no bickering, no second guessing allowed. Go out in the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh probably air. Pretty cool. This guy studied too much longer than I did. <laughs> All right, what I've got to do with this verse here is to deal with continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Y'all ready for that one? All right. First of all, salvation is a gift. Y'all ready? Y'all know I'm going to go where I'm going with this. Y'all understand it already. None of you are confused about working out your salvation, right? Oh, okay, well, I'm going to go over it anyway. <coughs> Salvation's a gift. It's a, it's a gift that's been paid for. But think of it in terms of a gold mine. Someone gives you a gold mine. It's worth millions. The only issue you have is that you got to get the shovel and the pick, and you got to go find the gold. So you've already been given the gift of salvation. You have it. What we really have to look at now is, are you going to mine this gift? Jack London, some of you know who I'm talking about, who was in Alaska for a while and did some gold mining, wrote a story called um, All, A-L-L, All Gold Canyon. And uh, it's probably the best example of non-biblical literature that can illustrate my point. And so I'm going to just walk you through the story very quickly and briefly, hopefully. What happened is, is that Bill, the name of the gold miner, uh, he... Uh, was in gold in all gold canyon and he lay down at, at the stream to get a drink of water and when he looked up he was looking at this hill and so when he was finished with his drink and he was looking he kept looking at that hill and then he decided what he would do would be to go over with his gold pan and he would take a shovel at the edge of the hill in the water and put that in his pan. So he did that. Are you all familiar with how the pan goes? Okay. So he gets his pan and he's got some, some gravel and rock and you name it in there and he gets him a little water and he starts working it and the idea is to wash out with the water the lighter stuff and the, the pebbles and things that aren't gold because gold is just a little flake of a thing less than 
that even, unless you get the mind. And you're looking for the mother load vein. But the hard road is with the pan. And so you have to keep doing this. Get you another bunch of water and you keep working this until you get it down to where it looks like you've got a little sand in the bottom of your pan. And once you have this bit of sand, it just looks like a little strip <coughs> of dirt. Then you work that a little bit more. And at some point in time, you're able to look at it and you can see a little fleck of gold. Bill did this, and Bill, you can imagine, this takes a while. So he put some more water in it, he went at it again, and pretty soon he had two. Went at it again, and he had three. This is taking a while, you understand where I'm going? And then he had four. He managed to get seven out of that particular shovel. Seven little flakes of gold, not worth much at all. So and then he decided he would work that stream upstream, downstream. So he started downstream and he took another shovel. And he did that. And he did it again. And again. And it was seven, five, four, three. He decided he was going the wrong direction. Still on the bank, on that shore, Bill is still there. Goes up the other side, starts here. Another pan. Another load, and up he goes. Nine, ten, twelve. Now, what he saw when he was laying at the creek getting his drink was where it was all coming from. It was coming from the hill, washed down to the creeks. His object in mind that he thought would work was that he would then move up this hill, digging one shovel at a time, and working his pan, going back to the stream to work it again. He's doing this at the moment I'm talking about most of the day, and the night is coming. But what he's determined is, is that he will draw an inverted V up the side of this mountain. And that where he thinks that V ends is where he's going to find the greatest bunch of gold that he's looking for. The problem with that is that on the creek side, there's not much digging. But as you begin to mine your gold and start making your vector, your V, you have to dig deeper each time. And it takes longer before you find enough gold that you had down at Creekside to know that you're still finding the gold as you go up. Sometimes as he went along, he would have to dig one foot, two foot, panning each of these as he goes, and the two or three days are going by as he continues to work this, and he's oblivious that there might be somebody out there that wants to take his mind. Totally forgot that. So he continues, and then when he finally gets to almost to where he thinks he's supposed to go, he takes a long shot, and he thinks, I think it's right there, and he goes up and starts digging. And going back to the stream from up the hill, panning back and forth, back and forth. He missed it. It wasn't there. Back to his old plan and stop listening to those voices. Go back to doing what he was supposed to be doing to work his plan as he had originally decided. Of course, 
Bill found what he was looking for. He already had his gift, but he had to work it out in order to obtain it, in order for it to, to be his, for him to possess it. And you've been given the gift of life by our Savior when you said yes to Jesus. You have the free gift of salvation. It's yours. What Paul was trying to tell you here is that you need to work it out. If you expect to get anything out of it, you have to give something to it. And the more energy and effort that you put in, the greater your relationship with God because you draw closer to him as you, as you do what you're doing. A lot of us have this fabulous gold mine that Jesus gave us. You know what? We're not working it. Worse than that, we let thieves come in and steal our fellowship and all the other things that go with having a Savior that gives you eternal life. Can you explain that to somebody? It works. So let me give you, give you some more. Consider that this, that, that this salvation is a gift. Consider it's a gold mine. The more you work at it, the greater are the riches. The more you put into your studies about Jesus, about his life, about his ministry, about how you can do the same kind of life and ministry as Jesus, the richer you get. The word work out there is the, is the, it's, they're trying to express it as a, as a math problem. Now some of you mathematicians know more about this kind of stuff than I do. But you've got to go through all the steps of a particular equation and you've got to do them right to get the right answers. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Some mathematical equations have parentheses. Some of them have lines underneath them with numbers underneath it, like dividing by and things like that. You have to satisfy each of those individual equations to bring them to a number that eventually looks like two and two makes four. You with me? If you don't work it out right, it don't work out. Y'all with me on this one? Okay. Uh, Pythagoras theorem is one of them and it's, it's full of A's and B's and, and stuff like that and if you don't get if you don't work each piece individually till you get it where it's supposed to be it never gives you the number at the end and some of you are saying yeah okay <laughs> all right so it's like a math problem it has a conclusion conclusion now let me help you a little more with this, this uh, work out your salvation thing. What we're not talking about you working out is justification that already took place when you got salvation. When you got your gold mine, that was the gift that came with it. You were justified how? By faith. And where did faith come from? From the Spirit. God gave it. It's nothing you did. You didn't even have to come up with enough faith to get it. Because you couldn't. It's free. The part you're working out is your sanctification. Let me say it a different way. The part that you're working out is your relationship with God. You've met him when you said yes to him. Now it's up to you to decide what you're going to do with him. Are you going to mine this gold mine and get everything he's got? Or are you just going to go along with, oh, well, I'll get by. You see? Well, I know the folks that are here, you're looking, you're, you're, mining, you're mining gold tonight, you see? You're here because you want to know more about Jesus and all that. You know, and so you're working on the sanctification part. What you're trying to do is live a life that is pleasing to God. 
and <coughs> keep in mind that anything you do, let me say it this way, any gold mine you work, you have to <coughs> work. Anything you expect to get out of your Christianity, you have to work. <coughs> you got salvation, it was free. What you're working on is a relationship with the Savior. What you put into it is what you're going to get out of. You all with me? That's that verse. Not a big trouble spot at all. Let's do 13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Okay, who's going to help you mine this gold? It's right there in 13. We do not work alone. The Holy Spirit works with us. Not only with us, in us, for us, to us. You all with me? You see, so you, you've been given your salvation. You have justification. You're working on your sanctification. And the degree to which you have some of that at some point it will become what? Glorification. All right. See, you guys are sharp. Let's do the do everything without complaining and arguing. That's verse 14. Remember there's a problem in the church. I told you this is a rare book. The only problem in the Philippi church was there was two women. Give it away, didn't I? All right. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Paul brings it up. He, he has, he's going to speak to it. Sooner or later, Paul's got to get it off his chest. That here's the problem. Let's fix it. And he's going to tell him how. But when you look at the Israelite people, as soon as they're out of Egypt, they're caught between Pharaoh and the Red Sea. And the first thing they do is they start murmuring and they start murmuring. That means they start complaining. complaining. And they're complaining about Moses and God. And their the big joke of that text that you read it, they, they're murmuring about, weren't there any places to bury people in Egypt? Well, Egypt had a, a thing about getting people buried. It was their national culture that if you died, goodness, we're going to make a mummy out of you. They never made any daddies. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> <laughs> so when you look at the trip, you get to, to Maha and they're murmuring. You get to the, the uh, wilderness of sin and they're murmuring. Their little complaint is, is that they, they're thirsty or they want something to eat. When they get their thirst and hunger fed, they don't like that anymore. So they're murmuring again. And I counted about 12 or more times of just their little trip through the wilderness of, of complaining and murmuring. And their biggest murmur was whenever 10 of them decided they'd out-talk a guy named Joshua and Caleb. And, well, they were going to kill him, too. Just to, I mean, that's murmuring. And, and the, the result is, is that they spent 40 years wandering in wilderness. One of them was named Sin. And what we want to keep in mind is, is that it probably only, what, took 13 days to go from where they were going to where they were headed for, where they come from. The murmuring got so bad against Moses and God that God sent snakes after them. Remember that? He'll get your attention. There should never be murmuring and complaining in any church count, in any church group, period. 
because you don't know when the snakes are coming. So it's murmuring and disputing in King James Version, whereas we see that they murmur against uh, complaining and arguing is, in, is what we have here. Let's go down here and look at conformity, Christ likeness, 15, 16. So that you may become blameless, we'll put a circle around that, and pure, children of God, without fault, you can circle that one, uh, in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine, parentheses, like stars in the universe, close parentheses, 16, as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. Let's look at blameless. That's without reproach. You, Paul is suggesting that now I think you have to look at the, the word just before that. Become you're working on your gold mine. You, you know, you're, you're still trying to be what you not yet are. And so we're looking at becoming blameless and pure. Well, I can't become pure. Or I can't become blameless. That's why you're working on it. That's why it's a become. If God gave you the gold mine already mined out, you'd be in heaven already. And I don't think I'm there yet. So... They want you to become children. He wants you to become children of God without fault. And uh, the King James Version says without rebuke. And the translation on, on in, in, when you get to the Greek on that word fault or rebuke is really the word blemish. You don't want to be a lamb with a spot because you're a sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Is that what it says? Which is your reasonable service. You all heard those words before. All right. What you're doing all this, looking blameless and pure and acting godly and all that far, is because you are in a crooked and depraved generation. We have been in a crooked and depraved generation for years. What are you supposed to be in this crooked and depraved generation? What's it say? In which you shine like stars in the universe. That in the King James Version says, in which you shine like lights in the world stars in the universe, lights in the world. And what are you holding out to the world? The word of life. See it? Pretty incredible. And, and Paul says, and he's talking to Philippi, he's writing this letter to them, in order that I might boast, is the word that's used in the New International Version, the preferred word, in my opinion, is the word that's used in King James Version, the word is rejoice. Paul does not want to boast. In fact, Paul, when he tried to tell the folks that he had been to heaven, he used the idea that it wasn't really him, it was some other guy, but I happen to know him really well. And he started out in chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians and he said, I will not boast. But I know this guy. And what he's really trying to say here is the word that is best is in the King James Version, which is that he will rejoice when? When? When the day of Christ. What is that? That's rapture. What he's really saying is, is that after rapture comes the judgment seat of God. And Paul is saying, I'm looking for some crowns. Not just for me, but for you too. And he was trying to tell the Philippians that he wanted to get to the day of Christ 
where he could stand back and gloat a little bit and look at what I did with all these Christians from Philippi and look at what all they've done with all these new converts and, and my goodness and look at all the crowns they got you know and so Paul is basically trying to say to them start mining your gold mine go out and get those lost nuggets of gold and bring them in to the storehouse that my house might be full we can't go mining if we sit here. All right? Go with me? And the reason he wants to stand there and rejoice is because he wants to know in his heart of hearts, I did not run or labor in vain, is what it says in your KJV, right? In this case, it says our labor for nothing. I'm not sitting in this prison just for drill, folks. Go out there and win the lost. So I can be proud of you at Judgment Day when they pass out the trophies. Okay? Moving along. Let's look at, I want you to see this one. In verse 17, y'all with me still? So Paul says, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. What you need to know about that is there were drink offerings. What you want to know is, is that the amount of drink offering that you poured on your sacrifice was relative to the sacrifice. So the better the animal sacrifice that you burned on the altar, the greater the wine sacrifice that you were also going to make. You couldn't put out the best there was as a sacrifice and then pour Kool-Aid on it. What was expected was is that if you gave this wonderful sacrifice that you gave a wonderful drink offering with it. And what you did with it as your sacrifice was being burned on the altar, you poured your drink offering on top of that. And the result of it, of course, is, is that over the years, that sacrifice of wine took on the connotations of joy, and the result is, is that the wine is now symbolic of joy and exhilaration in the Bible. And so when you were joyfully sacrificing and giving of the very best, you gave the very best of your wine as well. Um, the wedding at Canaan. They were making a wedding ceremony because they were, they were having fun. The wine ran out. Who gave the best sacrifice? Jesus. They never had a wine as good as that. Remember the story? All right. Um, Paul here is using an Old Testament sacrifice as an example to teach the truth that the way of sacrifice is the way of joy. Your sacrificial giving is a gift of joy. It should never be a burden for you to make a sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you can't give freely, and give the best, don't bother. Because the Lord looks on the heart and not the hand. It's not what your gift is giving. He's got everything. He don't need what you're gonna offer. What he wants you to give is the best you got. You know what he really wants? You. We 
got to take this one more step further and let's look at Galatians 5.22. Y'all got it there somewhere? Well, let me just tell you this. You got it for me? No, that's Genesis. That's close, though. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. What else? Joy, etc., etc. Et All right. Hebrews 12, 2. Can you find that one for me? Oh, here's, there you go. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, 